Susan Barger from the FAIC. Go ahead, Susan, whenever you're ready. Hi, everyone. Um, it's nice to have you here. I'm so pleased to see we have two people from Guatemala. We've never had any Guatemalans before. That's great. Um, so I'll get started. Happy New Year. Um, if you're looking for information about collections care, be sure to check out our website. There's the online discussion that you need to be registered for, but that doesn't cost anything, and it just takes a few minutes to register, and you can post questions. And I have a whole army of conservators who catch those questions and answer them for you. Um, and there's resources, and there are over 120 webinars that you can uh, download and listen to. And so keep up with our community. We have new webinars coming, new discussions, more resources. You can uh, keep up by liking us on Facebook or following us on Twitter. And there's also the Connecting to Collections Care announce list, which is only for announcements. So if, you're, if you don't get that email, you can go to this uh, website here and uh, sign up for it. And it won't overload you. It's maybe two or three announcements a month. Um, and you can always contact me. This is my email address. It's also on uh, in the website. So if you need to get a hold of me, this is how you do it. Uh, next month, we're going to have a, a webinar on care of quilts. And the next month, we're having one on uh, oversized materials, architectural drawings, and, and maps. So uh, pay attention to those. And um, I also wanted to let you know that the CAP, uh, which is now called Collections Assessment for Preservation, the application's open. They'll be open through March 1st. And uh, you can apply. Uh, it's usually on a first come first serve basis, and it's a great program. And so, if you qualify for a cap, be sure to um, do that. Now, I'm going to introduce Jean Louis Bigourdin, and he is from the Image Permanence Institute. And um, take it over, Jean Louis. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome to everybody, and. Uh... I have to start thanking Suzanne and, and Mike because they facilitate uh, this uh, this webinar, and we are really glad to participate. So, what I what I was going to do uh, this afternoon is really to provide with some uh, background background information about this web application, how we <laughs> dreamt about it, <laughs> and how we thought it was <clears throat> really really needed for the field. Um, and uh, I will then certainly give you a, a tour of the application. I will not uh, look into all the detail, but I think uh, you you will have some 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 good idea about what it can do for you. So what, one of the main goal really is to, uh, if I have to pick one sentence to define our goal here, is to make the, the archivist, librarian, and all the people who are in charge of collection way more uh, self-reliant than maybe they are. And everybody who step into a collection, you have so many material there. Uh, it's a little bit daunting, and it's always difficult. OK, where do I start to, the, to do the best thing and to take the right decision uh, for the collection? So of course, uh, during the past decades, I have to say, uh, there have been a lot of uh, tools coming out, and uh, we uh, certainly did our shared IPI. This is what I call the archivist toolbox. Uh, so you, you have a various publication and tools there who address uh, each of them some specific problem. But at some point, uh, it's always a little bit difficult. They're like uh, dots or like stars you know, in the sky. and how do I connect the dots and, and to really make the best decision? So this is really uh, from this aspect that the idea really of filmcare.org came up. And uh, yes, some 
we can imagine uh, some place uh, that all those various uh, data solution option where to do things will be collect basically organized into a uh, a methodology that really can benefit the people out there. So there is, uh, if you go to the home page, basically there is what I would call two tracks there. Uh, there is one track who focus on um, learning and teaching uh, a little bit about film materials, and the other track, which is really more like a, like a tool uh, to assess collection, to make conclusion, to implement the strategy. So I will go uh, through those uh, in these hours, and uh, but I want to, to give you a little bit uh, some reason there. Uh, why not focus on a web application instead of doing research of a particular film material, so a particular uh, narrow problems? It's. A, I think uh, we we are at a at a point now. After maybe I would say easily thirty years, if you go back to the to the eighties, that uh, we know enough to uh, probably stabilize and and protect for extended period of time uh, those materials. Uh, this is what it is. We also have can develop some tools that need to be put into use, of course, and that need to be put into a kind of overarching, basically, strategy. And this is really, that's really the goal of this web application. Uh, today, it's really easy to uh, forget about physical preservation for many people, because you can go in any conference uh, where uh, we will not talk mostly about pixel and scanning and so forth, but there is an incredible wealth out there, and you all uh, probably know that better than anybody else. So preserving the film in its original form is the first, and facilitating, facilitating that is what is the main, main goal of this particular, uh, particular web application here. Uh, the other aspect, uh, that are very, very important, and I would like to resume, to resume what we have to do in only three bullet points. Number one, we had really to understand what a film is, what it's made of, to really protect him against decay. Second, I think it has been demonstrated and demonstrated again and again that the, the really the most important factor is really provide an adequate, a suitable storage of the to those collections. And third, let's say we have all of this, we can't just walk away. So we have to really monitor not only certainly the, the condition of the environment, but also what a film is uh, evolving to. This means the condition of the film. So uh, this was really uh, the, the, ma the main reason. So we want uh, a tool we deal with film in a wide sense and not do only about movie or only about still or only talking about microfilm. We, we want to have a, a tool with a great education component. We want a tool also that can facilitate a decision-making process and uh, sometimes the task is very daunting because there is so many, so many parameters that can be uh, take to come, come to your face, basically. Uh, so the whole thing, uh, we really try hard to present this into a, a really concise form, and um, and that is the challenge we really put in front of ourselves there. So let's go for. Uh, the first track, which is uh, basically uh, learning about film. Again, here you have, uh, I will not go through all of them, but probably the, the main one. One of the things which is uh, very important, certainly, when you talk about film, is uh, they can come in many, many, many formats, as I mentioned just earlier. It can be flat film, roll, uh, many applications, and uh, actually, the nature of the plastic, since the film is always on a plastic support, 
can change not only in terms of uh, in terms of when the film is, uh, has been made, but also uh, the use of the film. So to uh, help the people, since it's the first step, knowing the film, right? Uh, identifying the base is very, very critical in that aspect. It will not be the same solution if you have, for example, polyester base versus a nitrate base, base um, materials. So uh, we can uh, categorize those formats in eight categories that uh, you can basically, if you don't know anything, <laughs> you can go through and learn. So what is asked to you, it's really a help to identification. The first thing you, you might be asked to answer here, if you know the period, you might choose a certain period of the materials. So that would be uh, in this particular area here where you can click on one of the period. Uh, if there is a marking, well, you can fill out this. And then you have a series of tests here. Who, the goal is to narrow, basically, um, the possibility to identify uh, that particular uh, that particular base. So in this particular case, for example, it's an example. Uh, we have a film uh, in the in the 80s. Safety. Uh, you can make a test of polarization test here. You will end up by a polyester. So the idea is not certainly that you will take every piece of film <laughs> that you have or every material and go through this this, uh, this methodology or use this tool because uh, as you use a few time, if you start from nothing, you will learn. And actually, all those little uh, parameters who help to identify the nature of the film they will become really part of your brain. So in this particular view, uh, you can uh, see how to carry the polarization test, and uh, that will uh, help you for, for the first time. Another example I think that I put here is, OK, everybody can know if I have a, a film coming from a steel camera or if I have slides. So that will go in this category. You can do the same approach. Here you can click on the on the date, and here it will give you a choice. So um, doing again and again, there is always uh, new people helping, volunteering in archives. Uh, if you teach, uh, uh, you can certainly use this particular uh, tool here to uh, to teach and learn to identify those plastic. Now, the other important component, of course, of film materials is the image material itself. And again, here, just to give uh, um, an idea about, I would say, the inventivity and the creativity of, of those inventors, uh, there is a section here that will help you to, uh, again, have a sense uh, of what is out there. If there is dye, if there is uh, um, if there is uh, transformed silver, if there is only silver particle, if there is uh, technical dye versus a chromogenic dye, so this particular part of the of the of the website uh, is supposed to help you uh, with that. This is an example uh, how you will learn from that. Uh, you have different views of the materials. This is an example of the Dufay color, uh, where you have microphotography, cross-section, where you can see here the color screen on that picture here. This is a cool thing to see, of course. And above, you have the emulsion and the silver particle. So this is the kind of thing that you can visualize here. Here is an example about the technical of film, where you have a cross section. In this particular case, here you can see that it doesn't look like a chromogenic three layer uh, structure here, but you can see the dye diffusing into the gelatin here. Uh, in this particular view, uh, you can see the silver particle actually who are there in the gelatin, just to increase contrast in this particular uh, 
material here. So going forward, uh, <clears throat> you have another very important, uh, very important aspect here, and that would be um, the visual, what what we call the visual decay guide. So what it is and what is structure here, the information is not organized by uh, processes. It's not organized by uh, even materials like nitrate versus acetate. It's really based on what you see. So you can imagine that you are on your table inspecting film here and uh, and you will uh, recognize something. So in this particular case, as an example here, uh, you click on dye fading. What you will find in this particular uh, part of the website is an explanation of what happened, what caused it, what to do about it, and a variety of images that uh, can help you to map the possibility. This is another example about plasticizer exudation here. So in this particular view here, you have, uh, actually this is a full coated 35 millimeter film here. And what you see here is the plasticizer who came out the surface on the magnetic layers. So in a way, this is the same type of decay that you can see here, which is actually a photographic um, flat film here, where you see actually the plasticizer here, which is literally pushing <laughs> the, the emulsion on the top. So this part of the website, there is a wealth, really, of, of pictures. Uh, I just couldn't resist to put a little bit more, certainly, pictures. And, and you can see that the, the, this type of decay was a big deal with microform, of course, in a microform, when you lose a little bit of the, of the picture, you may lose a lot of uh, information. Uh, also, on this track of uh, learning about film, you will find a timeline, which unfortunately, as it is now, it's really uh, focusing a lot uh, on motion picture film. And uh, this is something that we should uh, certainly in the future um, complete. But what you find here, so you can, at any time, you can uh, choose here an event, for example, here in 1935, and then you will have an illustration about, okay, here, is the, this is a Kodachrome uh, who came into, uh, on the market here. So you can scroll certainly again and again, and you have those event, and as much as we, uh, we can, you have illustration there. We sometimes can uh, go back actually uh, to, um, to the other part of the, of the website. Also, uh, on the home page, um, there is uh, a place uh, here, which is about the resource. And under this, uh, this category here, there is uh, different tools. I will not go into those now, because they will come up a little bit later in the, in the other part of the site. Um, so now, now there is the other track of the website, which is really caring for the collection here. And uh, to explore this, actually, this is where you need basically to uh, to sign up. But first, I will give you some background information. This part of the of the website really is uh, certainly storage centric <laughs> and uh, and this is because as I said at the beginning that the, the most significant parameter to really extend the life of those materials is really really uh, by providing the, the right storage for, for for the collection so how this idea come from uh, you can actually find uh, literally um, publication early on in the 60s and so forth who already talk actually about cold storage. 
but really the first first uh, first first publication that provide prediction in terms of stability this is a publication that was uh, published in in, in 1970 Peter Adustin, uh, that worked for a long time uh, at IPI, uh, worked also a long time at Kodak, and he was at Kodak at the time. And the story goes that uh, actually um, him and his uh, two co-writer of the paper, they had to go in a room, <laughs> publish this, <laughs> and, and it was really the first time that you could see a prediction in terms of die life expectancy. So how that was done at the time, uh, and it didn't change until today. The methodology just have been evolving and refined. And uh, it's by incubating basically materials at different temperature, when you are dealing with uh, some reactions, some decay, which is really dependent of temperature, where the RNU scientists uh, in the 19th century tell us that there is a way to plot this data in such a way that you can extrapolate. So you, you get a liner here and you can extrapolate life expectancy that will be on this axis here at any temperature that you can think of. So in this particular case here, if I wanted to know how much the material will last at home temperature, what you have to do is just follow this line and you will have a life expectancy. So this basic principle has been used for decades for a lot of materials and a lot of the data that uh, is available today, this is what they do. This is how the, the color guide came, basically. And what it tells us here, well, it tells us that at room temperature, 70 Fahrenheit, color dye will go through significant, significant decay after 40 years. But if you put this at 35 Fahrenheit or 2 Celsius, the same level of decay is likely to occur after several 600 years. So this is one example. The same idea uh, if you think about uh, nitrate decay. Unfortunately, the, the scope of the studio nitrate is much, much smaller, and the estimates are a little bit wider in terms of prediction. But it's also telling you the same thing. If you decrease the temperature, which is going further down here, actually the life expectancy is increasing. So in this particular situation here, a minus 10 Celsius, uh, you could actually, for this particular sample, extend the life expectancy up to 500 years. So one of the, what I said to you, to us is this is that the nitrate actually can last. Also, uh, if it's in the right, uh, uh oh, okay, I have to go back here. I'm sorry. Uh, same thing with acetate, of course. Um, this is the way it works. Room temperature, 40 years, uh, cold, uh, 35, it will be 500 years. So we learn a lot about this, and we try to expand that. So one of the questions uh, that we, we also had is, um, what is the critical point when we certainly have to do something? And you can see that when you look at the life of a acetate a firmer here, you can follow that particular curve here. At the beginning, the acidity, which means the degradation, is increasing. The degradation is expanding here, up to a point, and then you go very, very, very fast. So as soon as you are in this area here, you don't have much time to, to react and do something. So one of the one of the tests that I like always to to bring up here, it's try to answer that question: Can frozen storage stop in a way the degradation? And for that, we put some sample we were here at this critical point that we call the autocatalytic point here. 
inside freezers and over over time uh, we look at what was happening uh, there was two sets of samples um, some samples it was the same film basically uh, and some samples were, were kept at room temperature in the lab here and some samples in the freezer in the lab too and after five years six and a half, ten years, fifteen years, twenty-five years, uh, we again measure the, the acidity of these materials. And the good thing is that, of course, in the freezer, we never, never see any change up to now. Uh, at room temperature, the film are gone for a long time already. So this is where, where, uh, where we came to this idea of having a uh, having those eddy strips. I just if what it was, this slide is not quite right because it's supposed to be some color from blue here to uh, to yellow, but it's not there. Uh, but it's okay. So uh, we came to this idea of putting an acid-based indicator on a piece of paper, AC roll, and then testing. And then having those level of acidity that and the change of color here that tell us basically in a very yeah in a semi quantitative way the acidity that it's the condition of the firma here. So to organize those readings here, it's always a good idea to you know uh, develop a graph like this one here. And what it tell us from level zero to level three. This is the acidity, and the, which is increasing, and the condition of the film certainly is going down and down and down. So there is two set of data here uh, that was really used um, um, the develop develop IPI. We have some film collection here, and uh, the blue actually are the data when the film were tested in 1995. And the red were the result when we test them uh, in 2009. That's been 14 years later. So what you see here is this kind of shift to the left here, where you have more level three, and you don't have any more actually level zero. And basically, in that time frame, which is uh, 14 years, actually the collection significantly it's an very, very significant world shape. So all of this, and this is just a summary of the thing we, we have done here, um, we can collect <laughs> what we think was very, very important and what we did study. It's the infection behavior an important parameter. Uh, what kind of uh, preeminent or marginal role enclosure may play what is really the impact of microenvironment and, and especially what would be the benefit of uh, using adsorbent like molecular cells, uh, developing diagnostic tool, uh, defining some handling pathways. So those are the team really that we, uh, we explore over time and that we, we use really to uh, design that particular uh, uh, web application. So this, the challenge there was really to to translate uh, observation, uh, prediction, um, experience from from the field, survey techniques, statistical uh, approach to sampling, and so forth, into into something useful. And uh, and this it, it start to uh, to structure a methodology that when you go to the site, you will see here. There is some tab, we'll go from uh, characterize and then preservation overview, recommendation, implement, monitor. So those basically are the pillar of the approach that uh, we, we develop here and that we will uh, go through those. So the first thing you have to do if you want to explore that track, and at this day I think there is something like uh, almost 600 uh, account. This means at least it's almost 600, I don't know, institutions or people who uh, have explored this part of the 
of the web application here. Um, it's only, and that is a little the point, disappointment here, are only maybe 10% who went up to the web and do survey collections and so forth. But the first thing uh, you, you need to do here is uh, to sign up. That's free. So you email, password, this is a classic thing. And, and then uh, you can also, and you create your, your account there. You can also uh, choose Fahrenheit or Celsius, depending where you are in the world. And, um, and then progress. So maybe you remember the first step, it's really characterizing. So you have to get organized. Uh, you, you may have just a, a small collection at home and a few, a few film, or you have a, a small amount of film in your library, but you can have also a building full <laughs> of stuff. So you have to, to decide certainly if you want to approach uh, your preservation issue as a whole, that means the whole uh, building uh, collection, or if you are interested in individual collection, basically. So uh, once you have to, uh, w when you decide on that, you can go and you start by naming, by uh, indicating and entering the type of temperature and humidity you have, you maintain the storage, or maybe maintain by itself if you don't have any HVAC system and also decide what do you have, what kind of materials you have in the storage. So the system will store all this information um, and it will stay there and you will, only you will have access to that information uh, using your, your password. So this particular thing uh, will give you an overview here as you create your collection, you have a list that will go on and on and um, it's, a kind of, it's a kind of summary. So the next thing you can do is to have a preservation overview. And uh, behind the scene, I would say, every time you said you put a temperature, um, actually the storage of your, your, environment, your environment will be categorized. You will get a name. And it will be either room, cool, cold, or frozen. So this is something that uh, an approach that has been uh, developed in the in the MSQR and one of the tools I was talking at the beginning, and basically what it does it's uh, it defines a range of temperature that really will express the type of impact that this environment will have on the material you kept in. Next, uh, and this slide you will not see it the background will give you a kind of summary every time you you build on, and that is evolving over time, basically, because if you create collection and collection or acquire collection, you can you can uh, add to it. It gave you really a quick look. Uh, in this particular example here, you can see that this particular collection here um, uh, has a temperature, a room temperature, so that can be, you know, between between 60 and and and, and 70. Uh, so that is really uh, not a good. This one, for example, here, which is a frozen environment, certainly might not be a priority. It tell you also what you have in those collections. So this is really a first look, and and uh, and this is uh, in a way uh, the first thing you need to know before going really further. So next, uh, we will go into giving some recommendation there. And this is, uh, you will have a view like that. So you will again find uh, the name of your collection appear here. You have one collection here, another one, IPI collection, genre collection, and so forth. And uh, depending, uh, depending on the type of material you have, the material appear here, you will have a bunch of collection there, a, a, a bunch of uh, recommendation, just depending on the materials. You will also link to some tools. For example, in this collection here, there is color materials. So you have some recommendation about color here. 
and it will lead you, suggest to you to go to the storage calculator for color. The way this one looks like, it's really, uh, it's really an extended and digital version of the wheel that was in the color guide uh, that IPI had published. So here, uh, you can uh, do your own assessment. So first, you have certainly the, the actual condition. In this particular case, uh, is 21 Celsius. Sorry, <laughs> that is in Celsius. So, uh, so that that is uh, 70 about uh, Fahrenheit and the temperature. And it also gives you a number of years here. If I can read right here, it's 38 years at those condition here. Um, you may be satisfied, probably not. So you can explore by basically choosing different conditions. So you can move that cursor here. And you can save those results. They will appear in this window. So very quickly, you can have here in this table various alternatives of storage and, and start the conversation about between what you have, what you might want, depending on the life expectancy that you need for your mission. And, and, and this is a way also to communicate and, and also to learn how, for example, effective is to lower the temperature. If you do the same movement with relative humidity, if you talk about chemical stability or natural aging, certainly, uh, certainly uh, you will not um, see the same change. So that's, that should help, uh, you know, to, to see the various uh, implication of any change you do. So the, the next thing, there is also a tool here. There is also, uh, in this particular collection, we have acetate, right? So in the acetate paragraph here, you might suggest here, hey, why not do you uh, think about doing uh, a condition assessment of the acetate collection? So that will lead to the to the survey tool that is integrated in the in the web application. So the first thing uh, when you want to do a collection assessment, and again, it can be something very daunting, is oof. Either I have a small collection, and this is easy because it's easy to test every item, or you have a large collection. And the statistical sample will be really the, the only practical solution. So integrate into, uh, into the tool here, uh, you have uh, an option to determine how many samples, how many items should I test to have, uh, I think it's a 93% confidence level um, and plus minus 3% uh, error. So you can enter here, you can enter the size of your collection, if you know it, and automatically you will have an indication of how many, how many samples uh, you should really test to be statistically uh, accurate. So in this particular case, this is a collection uh, of 10,000, I can't really see on my screen, about 10,000 item. So I should test uh, just over a uh, thousand, I guess. In this particular collection, it's only a thousand item. So here I can get away with 650 item. Actually, if I have hundred collection, hundred item, actually I should test hundred. Everybody actually to have uh, a good uh, testing. So this is really the first, uh, the first thing you have to do before getting into. The second thing uh, is probably to uh, have an idea about uh, how to use the edit strip because here we are talking about acetate assessment uh, for conditions, and that's uh, we, we can we can talk about this in the in the in the question. So the other thing we we'll tell you here, so you can 
you have two options. Well, for now, you have only one option, but uh, you can enter the result. And actually, this spreadsheet is generated uh, automatically by the by the by the web application. So if you need if you need let's say a thousand samples, you you will generate a thousand row, and as you go, it will tell you where you are twenty percent <laughs> from your goal or fifty percent. And as long as you don't have hundred percent, actually, you will not be able to uh, to generate. Uh, the survey report that uh, you, you need. Uh, in the future, we are working right now into uh, developing a procedure that should be able to import Excel spreadsheet into that table here. Um, because if you go with your computer in the storage area, you may not have anywhere any connections uh, with internet and so forth. So, so it will not uh, work for you. So that is something uh, that uh, we will work on. So let's go to the report and see what kind of information you get there. Well, what you get there, uh, basically you get two, two graphs. And this histogram here, uh, give you really a picture of the condition based on the AD strips reading that you have performed. And it's an indication really about the proportion at each level. It's an indication of the urgency really <laughs> of the situation here. In this particular, of particular interest, of course, uh, here is everything which is 1.5 and above because this it's at and beyond the autocatalytic point and this is if you remember the graph a little bit earlier it's really really the time where the decay will accelerate so this is this particular portion of the of the of the curve so here this point here correspond to this sample here, basically. When you have a level tree, actually, you don't know exactly where you are on the curve. You are at least here or maybe above. Because when at a certain acidity level, the strip turn yellow and then stay yellow and so forth. So uh, this is really a measure of the problems that you may have. But what is interesting here is this particular uh, this particular area here, all those samples here, it allows us to make some prediction. prediction. So one of the questions that uh, we can uh, ask ourselves here when I look at this is how long it will take for this samples here, for this data here, to basically go into this particular level and be in a critical condition there. So in this particular instance here, at the bottom of the report, you have this graph here. So it gives you a picture basically of the level of today, 30, 35% or something like that, uh, of the firm are in critical condition. That's mean level two entry. But in five years, five years, in five years, it will be half of the collections. And why is that in this particular case? It's because the material is stored near room temperature at 70 uh, Fahrenheit. So this is the type of, uh, of invocation, uh, information and data which is really, really critical because it should, it should uh, make the point. And this is another, another use of this web application. What we hope is that it help everybody to formulate and quantify the level of needs of a particular situation. Think about when you um, when you apply for grant, right? Uh, Susan was talking about the CAP application grant here. Um, so this is typically typically this kind of work can be probably done within the 
the framework actually of those grants and uh, and you can really make a case and develop uh, a scenario and black and white you can give numbers certainly uh, about the needs of that particular collection in your institution in your library or wherever uh, you, you are so this is something you can really uh, play. Now, uh, you can also make some prediction uh, yourself by using the storage calculator for acetate. It's a similar tool uh, as uh, the calculator for color, but one there is one big difference, actually, and this is uh, the fact that in this tool you can focus on the film which is really degraded up to this critical point, the autocatalytic point. And now you can formulate the question, how long it will take for all those materials before they become in a critical condition and very soon after being damaged and, and being lost. So you can, uh, the same thing, you can choose various temperature here and uh, various humidity and look the way it affects not only the stability of freshly processed film, acetate film, as is indicated here, because frankly, there's not many anymore in, in, in archive today, but the key point is to look at those, the ones which are already degrading and the ones who already are at the, at the autocratic point. Something, you can save the data, you can export all the all, the, all the, the data here, and you can see by looking at this colon here, you can see the factor of improvement in this particular case uh, by decreasing the temperature. So you generate data, basically. That is what you do. But data uh, will certainly uh, are um, very, very objective. Once you you have done all that, uh, you probably are in a phase where you start probably dreaming. <laughs> this is what I want. <laughs> this is this type of stories that my collection need. This is what will be good for my institution. And uh, there is a lot of step certainly uh, before uh, before before getting there. So this is why uh, in the other tabs that we call implement, we can uh, try to uh, define, uh, I think it's an eight step implementation process, which basically uh, basically is the things that you have to think about before going forward. It proposes basically a kind of way to go step by step and in some particular cases, you have decision to make. You have decision to make uh, what would be the best storage solution, for example, for for your um, for your institution. Should I uh, look into a macro environmental, that's mean a vault or a space that uh, that I will put all the material inside and so forth? Should I uh, look at uh, a micro environmental solution and using sealed container and so forth. I mean, there is a, uh, several options there that actually are uh, discussed. So, in this web application, so and you go in some uh, in some of this uh, area here. I can't really see on the screen, <laughs> but uh, you you have link actually here will give you more information and and. Uh, key point really for you uh, to decide. So this is an example here uh, that you can find uh, either from the implementation page or from the resource tab over there. Uh, the first one basically compare two different uh, alternative of storage. What I call the macro environmental approach and the micro environmental approach. In one, in the second one here, you control the old vault. In the first, you create basically microenvironment. So to give an example, uh, using 
uh, molecular sieves in in um, in seal container will appear in the in the nidus. So this is a micro environmental approach who um, impact certainly the flow process, the the workflow, and a lot of different things like this. Um, but this is something who will help you uh, to compare. The other uh, resource here, it's uh, again, it's a comparison between various way to implement storage at low temperature. So everybody can't have a large coal vault. Not everybody need to build a large coal vault, depending uh, the volume of the collection, depending on the number of factor, uh, you can um, certainly use um, like home freezer and so forth. So, but because of this, there is some handling, some precaution to be to be uh, taken, and uh, this particular resource go into that that aspect here. Uh, so this is something that is not an interactive part of the website, but there is certainly uh, a lot of information that you can dig and a lot of link that you can explore to answer uh, some of the questions. Uh, and finally, um, once you have what you need, maybe, <laughs> or you are going in that direction, you still have to monitor uh, your collection. And that doesn't, uh, of course, uh, implies that you have to monitor the environment. It's also uh, imply that you have to uh, monitor certainly the, uh, the collection itself. You have to put in place, for example, a handling a procedure that will avoid damage cause a good example here will be avoiding uh, avoiding condensation of the materials. And for this, so there is some indication in bullet point here to help you to figure out. It doesn't have to be really complicated. Uh, it just has to be effective. And we can go over uh, when you have some, some question also on this. Um, it goes down the list, uh, monitoring the condition of the collection, that is something uh, which is important, especially, especially if you don't have a cold environment. As we learn, as I show you, well, if you have a frozen environment, things will not probably move for a long, long, long time. If you don't have that, actually, the ongoing deterioration of the film will not stop. So you may need actually to uh, monitor the collection. Again, it can be done statistically and uh, you can see where the collection is, is going. So in this table here, it gives some suggests some, uh, some time period here uh, that you should follow up some guideline. And you can see that if it's frozen, well, you don't have to do that <laughs> very, very often at all. Uh, in the other case, uh, you certainly have to pay uh, good attention to that. Um, so the other, the other aspect, of course, uh, is uh, a collection is not a static thing. Uh, there is uh, new materials who come in, uh, screening those materials. It's certainly and knowing at which condition they are and what they may need in terms of storage is very, very important. It's a matter of... Uh, or material flow there. Um, the importance of, uh, of uh, enclosures, actually this is something that over time it become actually less and less important. If you talk about acetate uh, materials, uh, it was a time that uh, it was a big deal. It was also a big marketing deal, uh, but there is no enclosure really that can solve I can give a satisfactory answer to the problem of chemical decay of acetate film. So this is the storage that will do that. However, uh, looking at enclosure who can are not rusty, uh, enclosure who are compatible with photographic materials, uh, that is very, very important and should certainly uh, 
keep in mind. Over time, there is certainly, and this is the, the last step here, uh, there is certainly the situation may evolve. Uh, things like, well, personnel may evolve. Uh, people may retire. Some new people may come. So I think that the education component also is a very important one because uh, the firm, if we do our job, will be there. And certainly we will have to take care of this for a long, long time. And at least it's uh, it's a goal. So there's only three important words that I can say. And if you bef before you go and use that uh, web application, I think we should have those kind of tattoo <laughs> uh, uh, and, and and think about them. We certainly need, need a, a, at least a sufficient level and knowing what kind of component a film is. And in a, in a simplified way, we don't need to 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 go into the nitty gritty of all the variation, but understanding the material is really key. Uh, storing and the prop storage it should be our goal, and uh, we are certainly not there, uh, because often we don't know also how to pay for it. And again, monitoring for, for a long, long period of time is also very, very uh, essential. So it's uh, this morning I was looking at uh, uh, the film care activity, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, there was almost 600 people that at least uh, account that have been that have been used for this. And it also give a give some uh, statistic here when the people uh, enter and create a collection and and uh, put the condition they are there. In the in the in the storage there, it gives some kind of some kind of picture here. So it's in a way telling that there is something like uh, almost uh, sixty percent of the materials are stored at home temperature, and we all know that well, this will not last forever. The material will not last forever, and there is really just uh, okay, almost the thirty percent in cold or frozen storage. So this is not quantitative; it's just numbers, uh, basically number number of situations like this. Uh, again, when you look at the statistic, I mean the acetate are all over the place. It's by far, by far, the materials uh, that are the most present in in our archive and depository. And so this is also one of the reasons that focusing on this particular uh, material, it's it's really really important. And this is really moving. All of those material into colder and colder and more suitable environment. This is really the ultimate, ultimate goal of this web uh, application. And uh, the people doing by by themselves, the archivists, the library, that is that is the, the most the most important. It's not that uh, I don't like to get email with questions <laughs> or, or phone call, uh, but I think. Uh, it's a way where it's a lot more efficient to try to uh, to to use this and learn at the same time uh, the kind of mechanic of, of film preservation. So uh, and finally, but not last, uh, maybe it doesn't look like that. But for any project, you need funders, and any age, I have to say, almost. Uh, Single-ended, <laughs> handed, really as as support everything about film preservation that IPA has done. So I would like to thank them, and of course uh, a lot of intern went through IPI, uh, either from a, uh, internship programs that we create with the EMEA and the Cessnik School, and those have really really contributed to to the whole project. And thank for that side advisors and so forth and of course my colleague uh, uh, who have who are the key of this of this goal here so I will stop there and I think I think there is quite a few questions <laughs>
so uh, I will go to Suzanne then. Okay. Um, I'm going to bring over the evaluation, I think. Yeah, here's the evaluation link because I often forget it. So please, okay. the evaluations are very important, so please fill it out. Um, and we'll go through these questions. Uh, and I'll just give them to you the order that they came. Um, okay. How can you do cold storage on a budget and limited space? And uh, Grant Briscoe it says they have a bunch of negative slides and a couple of films currently kept in in uh, canisters. Yeah. And so, so we have a couple of questions sort of along that line. How how do you okay? And actually, that question came up before you started in in your tool. <laughs> mm hmm. Okay. So um, I think okay, the, the question is uh, how I basically develop a budget, right? Depending on the size of the collection, right? Mm -hmm. Basically. So uh, I would say that uh, for um, the size of the collection and the volume of the collection, uh, first you have to know, let's assume that you need, uh, you, you have acetate or color materials and that we all know uh, that these materials really need the colder the better, right? So if it's a small collection uh, and really small, let's say that you have less than 19 cubic feet of materials, right? In this particular case, you certainly will have enough uh, with a, a typical household freezer. So there is a very good uh, Publication actually in the topics uh, I forgot the number. The Susan uh, Sarah Wagner wrote where she went to the mechanic of estimating all the costs. The particularity of using this type of freezer is that you really have to package the materials because this type of freezer don't control the humidity, and and at this condition uh, you can run into into trouble, basically, in terms of mechanical decay, softening of the gelatin, and so forth. So in this particular case, you will rely on the packaging. And uh, the best packaging there is, certainly, is the kind of aluminum foil uh, packaging that you can either buy at the size available, or even customize yourself and, and use the big rolls. So, so this will enter into the budget. Uh, you have to think about uh, certainly two pack, two layers is better than one because there is always defect and you will not look in your freezer for a long, long time if you don't have a, need access to the material. This is one, one of the options. Uh, you certainly need to budget the, probably the, the time you will have to spend to do that. There is an excellent uh, document also, I think we put in the in the handout, uh, developed by the uh, National Park Service about cost storage. There is even video who show you uh, how to do that in an effective way and organize. I think that will be maybe uh, the best for you to look into. And as I said, the, the paper from, uh, from Sarah uh, she go in great detail on the various price, so you will have to update those price, but I think all the guidelines are there. Uh, and and uh, um, so, an home freezer, I don't know, between uh, 700, 800 dollars, something like this. So, evaluating the, the volume of the collection is key first, I would okay, say. Okay, there's a question, if you store in a freezer, what is the best way to keep, well, actually, you just covered that on um, moisture and condensation. That's packaging, right? Uh, well, uh, there is two things. Uh, when you use a home freezer, of course, and you have the packaging, you are safe there. When you retrieve the material, the condensation will occur 
on the outside, right? So the trick here is to to really open or cut the seal when the the material is above the temperature is above the dew point of the room. But to make it simple, uh, you know, overnight warming up or 24 hours, this is what the people do because it's easy to remember. And then you can access uh, to the film and it will not be any condensation. Now, if you have a, a big or a small vault, let's say, and, and, you, and you walk in and retrieve the materials and in that particular vault, uh, because the humidity and the temperature is controlled, you don't have a packaging because you don't need it. Uh, in this particular case, you should use some type of uh, um, moisture-proof proof, uh, packaging, which could be as simple as uh, a cooler that you use to go camping or picnic, or uh, freezer bags, they come in large sizes, some type of container that basically will avoid the condensation of the object. And, and that's it. Uh, uh, so e even even a uh, plastic tub would do the trick, really. And again, here I would I would I would wait uh, to be simple, you know, overnight or 24 hours. Even so, and you can go to the website uh, in the resource. There is a, a tab there that will. Uh, indicate uh, really the, uh, how long it takes for, there's a few examples there, for 35 millimeter uh, of film or um, a box of film to equilibrate in terms of temperature. You will see that uh, most often it's a matter of hours, really, uh, but just to be safe, you know, uh, you can you 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 can increase that. It's better okay. to uh, um, to be on the safe just side. Threw in a question: Will condensation damage the film? Well, condensation. Uh, if in in my uh, okay, I don't know if she talked or he talks about a roll of film or uh, a flat film. Of course, the film uh, process uh, in in aqueous solution, right? <laughs> Developing, <laughs> fixing, and so forth. So, in a way, uh, they are used to water, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, the thing is, you will probably have some some change at the surface of the film. In terms, this is uh, it will be a kind of kind of physical. Uh, it was a, almost a mechanical decay there in a way because you will have a marker. Now, if you make a print from the negative, uh, chances are you will not see it. Actually, um, there's a question. Oh. You will you will see Now, uh, j just for the for the roll, if you have a roll here and for whatever reason uh, you have a lot of condensation, the moisture it's. It's kind of swelling, and and depending how much moisture the, the actually the the gelatin is absorbing, it can become like a glue, literally, right? And and so here again, you 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 have a risk for mechanical okay. damage of the film if you stay as a, as a roll. Blocking, you know, when you have blocking on a roll, where well, this is where you have a lot of moisture. Mm -hmm. And then the thing dry up. Okay. Does the temperature need to be as low as three in a freezer? Well, you know, uh, when you, uh, I mean, the freezer you buy, actually, even for your house, okay. uh, it's about what you get. Then you can you can adjust it, of course. Um, but this is what you get, uh, roughly, you know. This is uh, the settings uh, I put here. Now, every degree down, well, it's get better. But at some point, you know, the big freezers, let's say uh, the big freezer who house, you know, thousands and thousands of uh, cans there, 
often uh, because they are they are built right and that's you, you have the energy cost who came into the auction often they are between 20 and 25 uh, Fahrenheit it seems to be um, a good a good point to be for the collections okay. um we've had a couple okay. of questions that are along this line uh chris alsop says he's part of an amateur historian group that's trying to preserve local history and that they've a bunch of film film strips slides mm -hmm. and they're not really sure where to start and he says are there any tips for a beginner who discovered a collection of items which may not have been stored correctly over the years. Okay, well, uh, I think again here, uh, it could certainly, uh, I don't know how extensive the collection is, but using some of the resources which are here, and I am thinking in particular about the, the visual decay guide, and also the the base identification guide. Uh, I think in conjunction with looking at the materials and looking at the website, what what you see now does it look like a, a distortion of this? or so look at the distortion where it came from. I mean that will be a good a good step. The mixed collection. Um, and not necessarily a, a problem because there is again here a sweet point if you want to do the the, the right the right thing. I don't know how, many, how big the collection is talking about, but probably there is a lot of die fitting. I would say uh, if the material are older than forty years, uh, a lot of slide maybe pink. Uh, maybe he can if he had some some. Uh, some movies maybe starting to smell like uh, some kind of vinegar, uh, but using some strip certainly would give him some indication. If the purpose of learning, I would suggest that he look at the material okay. and use the website. If it's the purpose, that, that would be the best. If it's the purpose is preserving the whole thing, I think he, go, he can go right away and find a uh, a small container and and go through the motion of storing mm -hmm. them at okay. low temperature, depending on the yeah. values they um, have and so forth. Michael Nagy says, I, I notice you're not mentioning smells, different smells by type or strength of smells. If the film already, I'm assuming yeah. that you're already at the crucial yeah. stage. Well. <sighs> Well, the thing, uh, the thing with the smell is uh, there is uh, a lot of different generation <laughs> of archivists and preservationists and so forth that uh, there is a kind of objectivity, a subjectivity in, in the smell. So you can have in some time in discussion list, uh, you have, so, oh, I think it smells like uh, naphthalene or like uh, rinse butter and so forth. So uh, those thing, as you just said, uh, the decay is already there. It's already uh, probably, mm -hmm. even so visually you don't see, the decay process is really engaged and in an advanced state. So the industry, for example, the first level of change, this is something that you don't smell. It's, it's, uh, even, so, even so, we can detect one party per million of acetic acid in the air, but the, the eddy strip will really sense uh, below that. And the other thing is not necessarily healthy to always, <laughs> uh, you know, to, to work on that yeah. and smell <laughs> okay. the film. There, there's some questions about how, uh, about transferring things to DVD or copying things. But I want to say a little bit later. Yeah. Um, there's uh, someone who says... Um, we have a huge collection of nitrate sheet films that came to us after storage in an, years of storage in an outdoor garage. 
So, so um, what is incredible with with nitrate is that number one, number one, uh, there is a lot of nitrate in collections. Uh, I mean, even so, where well, you can read that eighty percent of the American cinema uh, pre nineteen thirty has been destroyed. Sometimes it has been destroyed just to yeah. recycle the silver, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, the nitrate which is around now, most of them, it must be pretty, uh, pretty uh, stable as in relative term, basically. But are negatives and, more uh, stable than? I mean, negatives in in enclosures are more stable than if you had a can of of a of film. I think I think really the main difference is uh, the the nitrate when it start decaying. The autocatalytic effect there, because you have a strong acid which is playing a role and so forth. I mean, when it starts to decay, it will disappear relatively quickly, more work quickly even than an acetate. So if you think about a raw film in a can, often you have quite a relative important mass of film there, you know, and, and which means a lot of catalysts that can be generated there. That means even a fast decay. Uh, with um, uh, flat film, it can be different because you, you are not necessarily in that particular contained situation. But I remember still, before I came in this country, actually, um, Actually, it was uh, in, a, in, a, in a museum in France, the Charles Chisson. They had acquired a, a collection of uh, postcard and postcard negatives from the beginning of the 20th century. So all the negatives, roughly 4x5, uh, were on nitrate base. And uh, they started to uh, realizing those materials. And they reuse those material in type of uh, polypropylene sleeve, which uh, were really, really relatively, uh, relatively sealed. I mean, not sealed completely, but relatively sealed. And in a few months, there was uh, some of those, quite a bit of those negatives, they completely oh disappear. In a matter of three, three, three five months, they, they were gone. I mean, the old gelatina was completely decomposed by the acid uh, produced by, by the so decaying nitrate. So, no, I, no, 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 <laughs> no, I, that's I've not happen. I've been in a nitrate fire, two of them, so. Yeah, I remember yeah, that. You mentioned so that. They were, they were films, <laughs> not, uh, yeah. 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 Um, Kind of. Okay. So uh, there have been a couple of questions about: um, Is cold storage feasible when you don't have an item by item inventory? Um, I, Say it is again. Is cold Sorry. storage feasible when you don't have an item by item inventory? Um, yeah. Yes. Yes, and and uh, de definitely. Uh, I mean the item by item inventory again here. And this is, uh, this is an irony, because when we start uh, working on the idea of the 80 straps, um, that it was beginning of the 90s, actually, the idea at the time was to identify, diagnostic and identify any single item, as close as you can be, it's already degrading, and that should be segregated, from the rest of the collection because of the of the you know infectious behavior and so forth that was a, that was a, the first intention but over the years once you have the tool actually uh, you realize that to do the right thing for the collection is really to do a statistical statistical sample and to take the right decision and move the whole collection into cold storage the other advantage also is if you don't have, you, you know, when you acquire those collections, 
let's say flat film it can be in two enclosure you have tapes uh, pre pressure sensitive tapes you have all kind of things who are uh, in a sense uh, not compatible with the photographic media who can create problems but you, you know what instead of spending and never be done realizing everything uh, segregating everything putting the whole collection into cold storage uh -huh. this is the best thing for the collections because everything will be slowed down and everything will be mitigated okay basically. um so we have uh yes if you can uh put things in cold storage um but the perfect is the atomy of the good what if you've hit the auto catalyzation point before you get Oh, he's talking about inventories before you've done an item by item inventory. So, what what you're saying is put things into yeah. cold storage as soon as you can. Um, right. Well, the thing, the, the thing is, uh, in the so you can go back to uh, to the presentation there and look at the the little experiment that I talk about when you had a bunch of film that were mm -hmm. at the autocatalytic point and then they were they were separated in two groups and then one group was put in a freezer the other group was staying in the lab and after 20 years uh i couldn't see any any increase actually in the acidity mm -hmm. in the one who were in the freezer the other one it was multiplied yeah. by 20 <laughs> at least so I can guarantee <laughs> there, I can I can guarantee that at least twenty years and of course way way longer uh, there will not be any significant change. Uh, it's it's a good way to 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 stabilize. Uh, so this is done actually. That has been is done in uh, the large scale. Uh, for example, large. Um, large um, archives uh, uh, may uh, they know they identify a group of material or collections with quite a bit of decay so this collection will be put at minus 15 uh, let's say close to zero Fahrenheit volt and then the rest of the collection may be at 25 Fahrenheit so and this, this kind of solution, the idea is the same if you talk about a small collection or a large collection, basically. Okay. Uh, the same so principle. See, we have a, about 10 more minutes. Um, let's see. Can your tool account for a storage environment that's not stable year-round? That is a tricky question <laughs> uh, because actually, uh, actually, uh, the tool here assume when it does the prediction that uh, the temperature you put in remain at that level. Now there is two things uh, we know that. The reality is rarely the case, and actually nowadays, for a cost-saving purpose, is even an option to sometimes let it fluctuate. Uh, but that is another discussion. Now, in, if you go in the resource of the web uh, application here, you will see there is a, a few uh, tool here, which is called impact of time out of storage uh, of the materials so it's not exactly the answer to the question here but this table give you a sense of if you use the material this mean actually by using it the material will be moved from the storage environment that you pay for and put in place as a freezer or whatever it is to the viewing room maybe what could be warmer uh, what could be uh, more humid and so forth so depending on the time 
that a material will do this during the year, let's say one day, two day, one week, etc., depending on how many times the material is required, basically, uh, it gives you a sense uh, of the uh, what you lose, basically, in terms of uh, life expectancy. You may, you will see by looking at those data that if you have a, f a frozen storage, actually, where let's say you you can expect 200 years. Very quickly, actually, those 200 years will become 100 and will become 80 and so forth. So there is certainly um, a loss there, which is inherent, and you can you can uh, come to the conclusion here: a collection that is fused heavily, you can ask yourself, is really worth worth it to. Uh, to have a freezer if I constantly use my materials? And this is a question that need to be asked at the, probably the curatorial level uh, where you are. Because it's true that you lose relatively quickly the benefit of, okay. of low temperature. Yeah, we have it, three it's clear. more well, quick questions. And we have four minutes. So, um, what are the recommendations in case of a power outage? Uh, Kristen Sar uh, Scorsone says, I have a film canister of high fidelity recording tape that has white dots on it. What are those dots? And uh, finally, is it best to digitize before freezing since uh, if you were taking things in and out of storage, that would be more damaging to fragile film, right? Oh, okay. When, uh, okay, so the, the first one, uh, the power outage. So if you have a freezer, you have a power outage, don't go and open the door to see what is happening inside. <laughs> this is what maybe, you know, we are tempted to do. Don't do that. Uh, a freezer, uh, a freezer is actually a piece of equipment which is really, really well insulated, and uh, it will take, uh, in some cases, 48 hours before actually, if you have ice inside, that it will start to melt. Actually, so the recommendation here is keep your cool. And uh, the power outage, of course, if it lasts for uh, for an extended period of time, is a different different story. But even if you have some ice inside the freezer, you are mm -hmm. supposed to have a packaging, right? So the, the water should not actually damage the, th the thing. So I will start to be worried, you know, it's after uh, after 48 hours, there is no power. Uh, I would transfer the materials, but it should be safe because okay. there is a packaging around. Now, okay, uh, the tape, the, the white dots, uh, again here, uh, look at uh, some of the pictures that there is in the visual decay, uh, plasticizer, exudation. Uh, it might be something resembling to this. Um, Make sure, uh, actually, I don't know the, the period of there. Um, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's probably, it's, it's probably not, uh, not an acetate, actually. Uh, but, um, you have in those magnetic, uh, uh, layers, the formulations are quite complex and, uh, it's difficult to really map what there is some, um, Oily component, there is uh, what they call lubricant, and that can also hap happen that it, it can migrate to the surface. It can be that, certainly. Uh, that is what the people talk uh, about. Um, and uh, there have been several attempts re really to. Uh, to identify, to identify what kind of what kind of tape will be more uh, at risk than others. To try to find markers to have a, a more uh, proactive approach to tape. Uh, there was some some people like Bertrand Lavedrine, of course, that you know, a few years ago, uh, he was thinking to 
to to develop like like uh, like a database really that we could uh, use to uh, to prioritize what we should be doing right and uh, but, but this it is it needs a miracle to happen okay. because it's so so complicated. Let's, uh, and, uh, is it best to digitize before freezing, and then we're going to have. Well, the, yeah, the the touring and freezing, the freezing and touring aspect of the materials actually, this is something that has been tested. There is uh, in the eighties when they were going into the space with film. There is a paper by David Copper from Kodak 1985. They did extensive testing uh, and uh, look at what was happening at the, at the gelatin, gelatin layer, at the base uh, level and so forth. And they never really found any significant uh, problem with uh, freezing and touring even, you know, repeatedly. I mean, it was very, very, very extensive test. So uh, I don't think okay. I don't think you have to be worried well, about this. Thank you. This was fabulous. My sense. And what a wonderful tool! I'm so glad you could give us a tour, and I hope a lot of people will use it. Okay. Well, it was my my so, pleasure, uh, really. Let's say goodbye to everybody. We'll be back okay. uh, in February with a thing on quilts and um, I'll post the recording in the next few days uh, along with the handout. Bye bye. Okay. okay. Oh you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne.